Hello, I'm Michael Woods, Chief Scientist at the Asian Turfgrass Center and Director of the Pace Turf Information Service. And this is the ATC Double Cut, where I talk about some of the new content and some of the classic content. And sometimes with Joe Galati, we talk about some of the content that absolutely bombs <laughs> on the ATC website. Today's topic is a bit of a procedural one, but I think it's especially timely because we're coming into autumn in the Northern Hemisphere. And for me, the autumn is the ideal time, the preferred time of the year to do soil nutrient analyses, to collect soil samples and send them for what are commonly called soil tests. And in the Southern Hemisphere, we're coming into springtime, which springtime, based on a survey that Larry Stowell did earlier this year, springtime is the time of the year when most turf grass managers actually do do soil testing or what their preferred time is for doing soil nutrient analyses. So whether you're in the northern hemisphere and you're going to do the sampling in the way that I like to do it, or if you're in the southern hemisphere doing it the way that most people do it, this is a... Uh, it's certainly a, a time of the year when a lot of people will be collecting soil samples and sending them for analysis. So I want to talk about some of the procedures involved with that because I used to think that this was a rather dry topic and I didn't give it a huge amount of attention. But now that I've realized that there is so much variety in the way that people actually collect, store, ship, process uh, their samples, I think that introduces some unknowns into the results and I would like to suggest how I think it should be done so that from now and then going forward if you are doing soil nutrient analyses if you are collecting soil samples and sending them to a lab for analysis that going forward you can get more consistent results and uh, be able to make even better use of the results I'm going to share my screen and show a post that is new on the ATC website. It has a title of Reminder to Air Dry Soil Samples. Now, this may be completely new to you. I've been surprised, actually, that uh, more people don't do air drying of soil samples. Now, I'm going to put a direct link to this, and I encourage you to go visit and read this blog and and or read this post that has the title of Reminder to Air Dry Soil Samples. There will be a direct link to this in the show description. And you can go to this post, and from this you can go uh, click through to read another interesting blogs, blog post from scientists at Kansas State University who did an experiment that involved leaving soil samples in the back of a truck bed, which I think is a pretty cool place to leave soil samples, and seeing how leaving them in the back of a truck bed after they'd been pulled from the soil, uh, how that changed some of the results. So I will encourage you to check this out and realize what can happen if the samples are not stored in a certain way. So uh, I, I mentioned that I've been surprised that uh, people don't air dry soil samples. I did a survey earlier this year, and I think it was something like 82%. I Did I write about that in this post? Hmm. I don't think so. I wrote about it in a new soil testing newsletter, which I'm going to mention a little bit later. Um, but there's, uh, I did a survey earlier this year about uh, how people are handling some soil sampling issues and i asked if people habitually or customarily air dry the soil samples prior to sending them to the laboratory for testing and if i remember correctly it's only 18 percent of the people uh, who responded actually do dry the soil samples which um, just surprised me because I have air dried soil samples for two decades and I recommend to my clients to air dry soil samples and I recommend to people who are not my clients to air dry soil samples and I just think it it makes so much sense to air dry the soil sample because um, well anyway in this post I'm going to explain why um, and uh, I, I would encourage you to also air dry soil samples so that's why I called it reminder to air dry soil samples. Um, and in 
in summary, the effect of this drying is you, you stop soil microbial activity and you also stop ion exchange reactions because we typically are not sampling soil that is uh, free of water. We are sampling soil that generally is above the wilting point, right? The, because we're, we are sampling turf grass, we're, we're sampling good turf grass or perhaps problematic turf grass to find out what may be happening in the soil. But turf grass is generally managed with the soil water content at field capacity or less. And at minimum, it will be at the wilting point or above. So we're in the zone uh, of having reasonable plant available water to prevent wilting. And in that case, there's some water in the soil. Now, when there's water in the soil, you have soil microbial activity. And when you have water in the soil, you have some soil solution. And their soil solution is the liquid um, the liquid that's in, in the soil pores and in between the soil particles. So the soil solution is basically the, the water in the soil. And that has ions dissolved in it. And those ions exchange with ions that are on the exchange sites. And that those processes continue unless something happens to stop them so long as there's water remaining in the soil. Now, when the samples get to a laboratory, after you send soil samples to a laboratory, the first thing that happens is they are placed in a room and dried. And the purpose of that is because that essentially stops all of those processes from happening. It freezes the soil and it, it makes the soil uh, properties fixed at the time that it became dry. Okay. So that is, that happens at the lab anyway. And I suggest doing it first, doing it as soon as the samples come out of the soil, you can just place it on a piece of newspaper, place it in a box, place it on a piece of paper. I use A4 paper or um, eight and a half by 11 sheets of paper. I place the soil samples on those, ideally on a table. If I don't have a table, I will place them on a floor. I like to have a bit of air movement going through there. So perhaps a, uh, a fan or somewhere with decent air movement. And in a sandy soil, this will be air dried within a day or two. And in a heavier soil, the, the sample may be dried in uh, two or three or four days. And at that point, I then consider it ready to send to the laboratory. Because if you don't send it to the laboratory immediately, what happens is you are sending a sample through the post or through the mail that may arrive in uh, two days later, it may be three days later, it may be four days later. If it's international, it could be up to three weeks or so, it, just depending on, on how it goes with the shipping process. And if you don't dry it before sending it, if you don't dry the sample before sending it, then there is all kinds of stuff happening, all kinds of microbial activity and ion exchange reactions that still continue to happen in that sample as it makes its way from the soil where you've collected it from the site in your turf grass where you've collected it and as it travels to the lab all of those reactions happen and that can change what the soil properties are but we I think that we want to know what the soil properties were at the time it came out of the ground. And that's why I encourage drying it immediately. I like to air dry the soil samples and it instantly, um, as it becomes dry, it stops all those reactions. And now we have the sample in the state as close as possible to what it was at the time it came out of the ground. As an additional benefit, and this is probably less important if you're shipping samples within your own country because the sample shipping cost may not be so expensive, but um, it's common when we're doing international soil sample shipping. So, for example, sending from Thailand to Ohio to send to Brookside Labs where I do all of my soil testing, it's common for the shipping cost to be 
higher than the actual laboratory analysis cost. And that's because soils tend to be relatively heavy. And, um, you know, so, so we're spending, if, if we're only sending one sample, definitely the shipping cost is going to be higher than, than what it costs to just run that one sample. Now, as if I, if I send 20 or 30 or 50 samples, which is more common now, um, if I do that efficiently and I send the minimum required amount of sample and if I've dried it, so it doesn't have extra water, I'm not paying to ship any soil solution. Uh, now my, my shipping cost will be a few hundred dollars perhaps, but uh, the laboratory fees would be more than that. So it becomes more efficient, but certainly if you're doing international shipping, you want to ship as um, low a mass of soil as possible. So it doesn't make any sense to be shipping water. It doesn't make any sense to be shipping water in your soil. And I, I, I think the main thing though, is I don't, I never want to question the results. I never want to think, oh my goodness, that pH is really weird. I wonder if that's, if that's really because of something that, that is occurring in the soil or could it be that there was some weird kind of reactions that happened because I sent a sample that had 20% soil moisture in it and it didn't get to the lab for 10 days. And any time that I'm sending a sample that is at uh, normal soil moisture content as it was pulled out of the ground, I always have that question in the back of my mind. Is that a real result that we got or is that an artifact of the way that the sample was handled. So I saw a blog post from the scientists at Kansas State University, as I mentioned, um, an update from Brian Rudder, who runs the soil testing lab there, and Dorivar Ruiz Diaz at Kansas State University. So even in a wet sample, if you refrigerate it and keep it cold, you can reduce the soil microbial activity enough to have to worry about it. But the problem that we have here is I don't think that people are sending their samples to the lab in a refrigerated container generally. Now, if, if you happen to live uh, right next to a laboratory and you collect the samples and put them in a refrigerator and then you deliver them to the laboratory yourself when, they, when they're still refrigerated, then this would work. But I think for most people, they're collecting samples and then they're sending them to a lab, even in their own state or in their own province, um, but sometimes sending across state lines or across international borders. Um, I don't think that we know what temperatures those samples are at as they make their way through the International Postal Service and airplanes and trains and trucks and uh, uh, storage rooms and sorting rooms and so on. Because of that, I don't really like refrigeration as a standard procedure for storing soil samples. And I much prefer the air drying because it, once they're air dried, we have the same and even better effect than, than refrigeration in terms of stopping both the soil microbial activity and stopping the ion exchange reactions that would happen in the soil. But in this case, consider what Rotter and Ruiz Diaz did uh, with their refrigeration as being the equivalent to what would happen with air drying of the samples. So again, they took one set of samples and kept them in a refrigerator and they kept the other set in a cargo box in a truck bed to monitor changes in soil test levels over time. And I'm quoting from their blog post, which I put a link to, and I hope you will check it out because it's profound what the differences were. To monitor changes in soil test levels over time, three sample bags were removed from the refrigerator and truck box every two days and were tested in the lab. So they collected the soil sample, they mixed it up, and then they subdivided it and they, they put it into multiple sample bags, some of which went in a refrigerator, some of which went into the cargo box in the truck bed. And then every 48 hours, they pulled out three from the refrigerator, three from the cargo box of the truck bed and started testing them. 
and it they shared this amazing chart in their blog post and it shows that after only four days the sample kept in the truck bed had double the amount of nitrate compared to the refrigerated sample and after 10 days the sample in the truck bed had nitrate at three times the level it was in the refrigerated sample so if you're looking at nitrate in the soil sample if you're not drying it if you're not stopping that microbial process instantly even if you're sending to a lab uh, and you think oh it's going to get there on second day service or, or you know it's getting there on next day service but it's two by the time it gets dried at the lab it's already two days elapsed you could see something if your soils anything like theirs was you could see something like a doubling of soil nitrogen now that's come that's happening because of mineralization so i think the soil organic matter would also be going down a little bit and soil organic matter is one of the important things to actually test for and i I'm always concerned a little bit when I when I realize that soil samples have been sent to a laboratory without drying and I don't know how much the organic matter content could have changed. I, now I don't think it's very much, but we spend money on soil samples and we make decisions about how the turf will be managed and what fertilizers will be applied based on the results so i think it's very important to make these results as accurate as possible by being very careful with the way the samples are handled prior to sending them to the lab so uh, some take-home points that they wrote about in their blog post uh i i copied here and and i will quote some of their take-home points and recommendations include uh, let's see. They said mineralization and nitrification led to more than a three times increase in soil test nitrate in the undried and unrefrigerated truck cargo box samples. Soil test nitrogen did not change substantially in refrigerated samples. And by implication, it did not in dried samples either improv then this is also quoting from them improper handling and storage of soil samples can dramatically reduce soil test accuracy and may lead to under or over fertilizing crops and and here's the one that is something that i've been recommending for a long time and um and I was pleased to see them come to this same conclusion. If same day submission of the samples to the lab is not possible, samples should be air dried or placed in a refrigerator set at 40 degrees Fahrenheit or less, which again, I believe that's about three or four degrees Celsius. Again, they recommend that if same day submission to the lab is not possible, samples should be air dried or placed in a refrigerator. Now, I've mentioned that I think as samples are sent to the lab, they don't continue to be refrigerated. So the only realistic solution, unless you live right next, uh, unless you live or work right next door to a laboratory and you're going to be uh, just dropping them off at the, at the loading dock uh, yourself, and you can control the temperature as it gets there, you can bring the samples in a cooler and you know that you're delivering them and they're, the lab is going to start air drying them immediately upon receipt. So that, that's, that's not very many of us. So I think that generally the only realistic solution is to air dry them. Ah, now I come in the blog post. Here's, here's where I did the survey. I, I did a survey in early 2022 and was surprised to find that 78.5% of the respondents do not dry soil samples before sending them to the lab. I believe I said earlier that I thought it was 82%. 18% do, 82% don't. It's actually 78.5% don't 
dry, and that would be 21.5% that do. I hope that after you consider this and you think about the amount of error that could be introduced into the samples, and not just error, but uncertainty. And if you have uncertainty about the results, then I think it's really difficult to be to make a confident decision and know that this is the right decision about how you're going to make use of the data from the results. I think that that type of uncertainty um, is is quite problematic, and and I hope that if I do this survey again, I hope that many more people will be air drying the samples as a customary practice. So I I put at the bottom of this a link to a new soil testing newsletter. I sent out that first edition of that newsletter about a week ago, maybe ten days ago, and if you if you have signed up already, then you got it, and I will tell you a little bit about what was in that. In that initial soil testing, um, in that initial soil testing newsletter, I talked about, or I wrote, I wrote what I think are some of the recommended ways to collect soil samples and to store soil samples prior to sending them to the lab. And I think for me, the really the key thing is sampling depth, okay? Because if you become a little bit uh, inaccurate or inconsistent with sampling depth, you'll definitely see differences in soil phosphorus because phosphorus is relatively immobile in the soil. So if you want accurate phosphorus numbers, you need to be really, really accurate um, with sampling depth, really consistent with sampling depth. Okay, so if you say, uh, I'm just going to, for example, I, I think this would be a terrible practice, okay, to say, I'm going to check how deep my roots are in this season, and I'm just going to sample to the depth of the root zone. So then you might say, okay, I'm, I'm sampling to 12 centimeter depth this time of year, which would be about five inches. And then uh, if the roots shrink, then you might sample to 7.5 centimeters, which is three inches. If you do that, you'll get different phosphorus numbers. And it becomes really, really difficult to make sense of what's actually changing in the soil and what, uh, what decisions you should make about those results. So I recommend keeping the sampling depth consistent. And for me, I like to use a 10 centimeter sampling depth, which is four inches. And I think that should be customary for turf grass. I am bewildered sometimes when people take samples to a depth of six inches, which is 15 centimeters, or eight inches, which is closer to 20 centimeters. I don't think it makes a lot of sense because most of the roots are above that level. Most of the soil organic matter is above that level. You'll certainly have a, a concentration of roots and organic matter above that level. To me, it makes um, it doesn't make so much sense for turf grass to sample at depths that are typically used for agricultural fields. So for agricultural fields, maybe, I mean, if you're growing corn or soybeans or something, then then uh, that this advice is not for you. But if you're growing a perennial turf grass crop, my standard recommendation is to use a 10 centimeter depth, which is four inches, unless you've got a really good reason to use a different depth. And one of those really good reasons might be... Um, that you're growing seashore paspalum or fine fescue and your root systems are 30 centimeters deep and they stay that way and you're just like you know i i i really want to sample more of my root zone so i'm going to sample to a 15 centimeter depth that that would be one good reason but if you do if you make that decision make sure that you do sample to that depth consistently every time sample to the same depth if you uh, another good reason would could be my potting greens are poa annua 
and they're in shade and they rarely have a root depth deeper than five centimeters and it just uh it, they, you think it doesn't make any sense to sample to a 10 centimeter depth when your roots are only going to a five centimeter depth. I, I've mentioned before that I think it's good to be aspirational. So for me, uh, even if you, if you don't have roots to a 10 centimeter depth, I have seen Poa annua roots that go that deep. So I've mentioned that I think it's nice to be aspirational and try to get, uh, you know, try to grow roots to that depth. And because of that, I, I still like the 10 centimeter depth. But if you, if you realize that your roots just don't go that deep and you, you think that it makes sense to do a five centimeter sampling depth or a, uh, a four centimeter sampling depth or something like that, um, which would be two, two inches would be five centimeters, then yeah, go ahead and do that. But just be consistent with that sampling depth. Because if you're not consistent with the sampling depth, you'll definitely see changes in the results that are not real changes. They're just an artifact of the way that the sample has been tested. Something else that is inconsistent in the way that people collect soil samples is whether they leave the plants on the samples or not. And I used to, years ago, I used to pinch off the, the top because I was taking a lot of subsamples. And so I would just pinch off the plants and break them off from the soil. And if there was a little bit of thatch, maybe a, a half inch, a, a centimeter or so of thatch, I might break that off too. So I was just sending in the mat layer and the soil. And I would discard those, um, those pieces of the, the tops of the samples, the plugs of grass, I would discard those and not send them to the laboratory but i realize that's kind of an inconsistent way to do it because each time i'm doing that um i'm doing it maybe at a slightly different depth and i realize that other people some people might cut it off with a knife some people might pinch it off a little bit deeper or a little bit shallower it's not consistent but you know what is consistent is all that stuff gets removed at the laboratory by a machine. It's all going to get removed at the laboratory anyway for doing standard nutrient analyses because they're testing the soil. They're not testing the plant. So um, soil is defined. Um, well, the, the sample that gets def that gets measured at the, uh, at the laboratory is going to have all of the undecomposed living and dead plant material removed any any living or dead plant material that's not decomposed that's not considered part of the soil so it gets removed by a grinding and screening process at the laboratory the samples are crushed or or blended a little bit to break them up and then or you know they're ground a little bit to break them up into their individual uh, components uh, in terms of sand and, and clods of, of soil that are relatively small, and then they're passed through a screen. And that, that screen captures all of this undecomposed material. So that's a standard way to do it, and that machine does it exactly the same way every time. So I recommend doing the removal of that material that does need to get removed let the laboratory do it don't try to do it yourself so uh i've made three recommendations so far um, i mentioned that this is a procedural type of atc double cut and the procedures that i'm recommending include when you take the sample leave the plant material on it don't try to remove it that's, that's one recommendation. A second recommendation is to sample to a 10 centimeter depth, unless you've got a good reason to sample at a different depth. And um, no matter what depth you are sampling at, uh, sample at that depth consistently. Sample at that depth consistently in order to ensure that the results are interpretable. And another recommendation that I've made is to air dry the samples which i understand that uh 
it, it's probably less common than it should be. And uh, I, I really encourage you to, to take the extra time to do that. It, it just takes a couple extra days and it improves the accuracy of the results. So I think if, if we're going to do this, let's just do it right. Let's, let's do it so that we can get the most accurate results possible. Let's see what I wrote about those in that newsletter, um, that, that soil testing newsletter, which you can find a link to sign up to that at the bottom of the blog post. And uh, if you're really into soil testing and you want to hear more about this, you can, you can sign up to that. I, I make that newsletter or let's see the, I guess the way to say it is the target, my target audience for that particular newsletter is not really the general public. It's more for ATC's soil testing clients because we get more and more clients around the world. And I want to make sure that everybody's on the same page, understanding both what I'm recommending in terms of sampling and then it, um, making sure that they understand what I'm recommending, why I'm recommending that. And then I will share some tidbits and uh, interesting facts and interesting notes and information about the way the samples get tested at the laboratory and how I make the reports, um, how I make the interpretation and the recommendation based on the uh, laboratory tests. So it, it all starts with getting a good sample. And so if we don't know the sample depth exactly, or if the if there's been some haphazard removal of some of the sample, that's like uh, if, if we think about uh, how we should handle the sample so that we can minimize the variability, then we should air dry them, we should collect them to a specific depth, and we should let machines at the laboratory remove any material that we don't want rather than us trying to remove that material. I have some other uh, other recommendations um, related to whether you do composite sampling. So composite sampling is the standard way, which is take multiple samples from an area. So uh, for example, a lawn, if we consider a lawn, we don't just go take a sample from one location on the lawn, the standard recommendation is to take a minimum of 12 subsamples from that lawn, put them together in a bucket, mix it together. From that bucket where it's all been mixed together, now draw a subsample out of that after it's been mixed, and that will then be considered the sample. Um, so that's the standard way to do it. Um, and I know most people are doing it that way in turf grass where they're taking 12 or more subsamples and mixing them together and sending that to the laboratory or sending a, a subsample out of that to the laboratory. I, I'm not sure that that's the best way. I'm not going to talk about that in this double cut. That's a, a, a slightly more complicated topic and a slightly different one, but I... Uh, I wrote about it in the newsletter a little bit, and I've started doing testing for my clients. Um, well, I tell them if, if it was me, I would just take a single core. I, I don't really want to do that subsampling right now, um, the composite sampling. I, I, I think that once we start mixing the samples together, all of a sudden we don't know what we're dealing with anymore, I, I think. Uh, so I would rather take an individual core and we know it's exactly this and we do that at multiple locations and I like to make the fertilizer recommendations based on that so that is two different ways of sampling it is doing individual cores or it's doing composite sampling so for my clients uh, for the ATC soil testing clients I also mentioned uh, you, it's up to you to decide how you want to do the sampling and just make sure that you let me know how you've done it because the mathematics involved in analyzing the results and making fertilizer recommendations are slightly different. The way that I calculate the average value, the way that I calculate the average 
um, potassium or phosphorus or organic matter content in the soil uh, is slightly different. But I, but for me to know which equation to use, which type of report to generate, which calculation to make, I need to know how the samples were collected. Were they collected as single cores or were they collected as composite samples? So that is something that I've been working on for a long time and I'll be talking about that some more going forward. Um, I think that's enough now for this ATC double cut, the procedural one. I, um, I think soil testing can be a really useful tool. Don't overdo it. I like to sample just once a year for most places. Um, I'm going to do a blog post about MLSN where I saw um, some people wrote a great post about MLSN, uh, but they were recommending doing soil testing twice a year uh, to understand how to use MLSN. I, I think that's one more time than is necessary. I think you can do just fine just testing once a year. So I will do another blog post about that and talk about that because I think these soil testing procedures, getting them as standardized as possible around the world and um, making sure that we get the results that are as accurate as possible can allow turfgrass managers to make the best decisions based on those results. Thank you for listening. I will sign off now for ATC from Salem, Oregon. I am Micah Woods.